Welcome everyone to another episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories Podcast. We got another good one for y'all today as we continue our coverage on scary let's not meet stories that have been shared by internet users such as yourselves who are listening today. If this is the first time you're joining us, then make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell as we upload some of the best true crime and scary stories content that you're ever going to hear on YouTube. Also, if you yourself have a scary story that you'd like to share for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. But with all those formalities out of the way, sit back and relax as we take you on a deep dive through these scary let's not meet stories. Enjoy. So I'm going to try to recount this as accurately as possible. But this happened 16 years ago, and this isn't a story that I share often, but Reddit has a way of making you open up. My friend Mike and I are at a bar one night with a friend of ours. We're there with our friend Art, an older guy. We've known him for a few years from hanging out at clubs and stuff. We're in our early 20s, and Art is in his mid-30s or so. But hey, we're all having fun and we're trying to pick up chicks so age isn't really an issue with us. The night comes to a close, and Art asks us if we want to go to a party with him in West Chester. It's about 30 to 40 minutes from where we are, but it's in the opposite direction of home. There was no guarantee of how big or fun this party would be, so we politely declined and headed to the after-hour spot near our house. Fast forward a couple of days, we read about a girl missing out in the West Chester area. We joke and say, thank God we weren't out there, and we let the news pass. Fast forward another two years, an arrest is made concerning the missing girl. The girl? Amy Willard, that was her name. She was murdered, and her body was discovered a few days after she went missing. The story made every headline in the area, and I believe even got some national attention as well. In fact, the show Forensic Files did an episode about it. The murderer, you might ask? Arthur Bomar, the same art that Mike and I were hanging out with the night Amy was murdered. Had we gone with him to Westchester, it is possible that we either would be in jail with him, or even worse, I wouldn't even be here typing this. You see, Art killed a man in Nevada and served 11 years for it. When paroled in 1990, he moved to Pennsylvania. He was arrested for breaking and entering in 1998, and when apprehended, he was driving the car of a woman named Maria Cabuenos, whose remains were found in March of 1998, and her murder had remained unsolved, and still to this day it is. They linked his DNA to the Willard case. And, well, there was a conviction. As of the writing of this story, he still sits on death row today, I believe. Before I begin, do allow me to apologize for being a bit sparse on the details. This is not my story. This one was told to me by my aunt one memorial day when I was visiting up north for a family reunion. Unfortunately, I didn't find this up until long after she had told me the story, so I'm unable to ask her about the specifics. However, it's the first story that came to mind when I stumbled across this subreddit, and after some careful consideration, I think I'll fit it here pretty well. Back in the late 90s, very early 2000s, my aunt worked in an office, pretty ordinary workplace, cubicles, water cooler chatter, copy machine jams. The guy in the cubicle next to her, Thomas, was anything but ordinary. He was the weird guy at the place. You know the type, the guy everyone kind of feels on edge around. The guy that all his co-workers thinks has the capacity to go postal one day. The guy no one really wants to spend too much time alone with. Being his cubicle mate, my aunt had to put up with a lot of his oddities. Sometimes he'd peek over the divider at her and just stare. Oftentimes he'd make strange comments about female co-workers' appearances. 
One thing that really struck her as odd was oftentimes she'd hear him whimpering as if he was quietly weeping on the other side. Nothing super threatening, mind you, but enough to make her feel a tad ill at ease around him. One day she notices Thomas is gone and his cubicle is cleared out. The water cooler chatter also picks up. It is revealed that Thomas had been axed and charged and convicted for making threatening phone calls to a couple of female co-workers, one including a rape threat. Not only that, but hidden surveillance cameras during the stealthy investigation of these allegations had actually revealed that the strange whimpering my aunt had heard from Thomas, well, it was not him crying. It was instead from him pleasuring himself in his cubicle. He is subsequently sentenced to 75 days in prison with three years parole. My aunt then thinks, good riddance, and then moves on with her life. A few years pass by and my aunt is watching the news one night when something catches her attention. Thomas had apparently been arrested again, this time upon investigation of the murder of a nine-year-old girl in Tahoe. Once proceedings began and media attention was being garnered, she was overwhelmed by an influx of new information about Thomas. It turned out that the bad vibes everyone at the office felt were for good reason. Thomas was one sick bastard, much worse than they'd originally thought. In trials that brought to attention that Thomas had been sexually abusing his son, TJ, since he was five or six years old. As TJ got older, Thomas got him to bring home young girls for him to molest regularly, including TJ's own girlfriends. Eventually, Thomas had dragged TJ so far into his depravity that this culminated in TJ luring a nine-year-old girl into their apartment where his father brutally raped and then murdered her. TJ even covered for his father when the girl's parents came searching for her as she lay tied up in the back bedroom before going off to dump her lifeless body down an embankment alongside the highway. Tragically, a very bright young girl had to die for him to finally be caught. But Thomas was convicted, and furthermore, he died in prison in 2001. No one will ever have the misfortune of meeting Thomas again. TLDR Aunt found out she sat less than a foot away from a pedo slash murderer that frequently pleasured himself at work. So this just happened last night, and after no food and barely any sleep for the last 10 hours, I've woken up this morning ready to post what happened last night. My apologies if it's pretty long. We live in a court in an upscale neighborhood in a large city in the US. Our court faces the expressway, and directly across from our house is a PG&E campus that has a pretty open field that you can cut through to reach the streets to exit the neighborhood, and then get back onto the expressway. My parents were out at a concert, and my sister was at work, and it was about 7.30pm when I decided to head to my boyfriend's house, who lives 5 minutes away. Now, before I left, I had this weird nagging feeling that I need to leave our living room light on as well as the porch light. This will mean something later, I promise. So I left the lights on, got in my car, and then drove off to my boyfriend's house. An hour later, I get a notification on my phone that the ring camera that is positioned at her front porch suddenly went off. I immediately knew that something was wrong, because I knew no one was supposed to be home for a while. So I opened up the app, and I don't see anything, and I'm waiting for the video to populate, and I see a guy in a black hoodie walking up to our porch, knocking on the door, and then moving away from said porch into the dark. Now the way our camera is positioned it makes it very difficult to see his face, but my dad was adamant the guy had a mask on. About one minute after that, I get notified again, and it shows the guy walking back up to the door, knocking a bit louder, then moving away from the porch again. At this point, I knew it wasn't a prank, so I let off the siren through the app, 
hoping it was going to deter him, but when I didn't see him in the camera, I knew he had gone through the backyard, so I called the cops. With the way the dispatcher was talking to me, it almost seemed like she thought it was a false alarm, but I was insistent that someone was trying to break in. She asked me to drive back to my house, and once I get there, to call them back. I feel like unless I called back, they had no intentions of sending a cop to check up on things. My boyfriend and I drive up to my house, and don't pull up in the driveway, but we do park across from my house, and turn off my car lights. I left my sister's windows blinds open, thank god I did, and kept looking at the window from my car, as I knew that was my only way to see into the house, and I dialed the cops again. 30 seconds into the phone call, I notice flashlights through the window, and I tell the dispatcher. I initially thought it could have been a car driving by from the other side of my house, but the thought was shot in 10 seconds when I saw the silhouette of a man looking through the window. The moment I saw the silhouette, I yelled into the phone saying, Someone's in my house. Please hurry. The dispatcher told us to drive out of the court and park a bit away for safety while we wait for the cops to arrive. About a minute or two of us sitting in the car and checking behind us, my boyfriend yelled, I see him walking ahead, and we see a guy in a black hoodie holding a bag, fast walking down the street to our right, and hiding behind the shadows of the corner house. We later put two and two together, and we think he left my house, cut through the PG&E grassy area, and tried to escape down the street not knowing my car was parked there. I saw him and I shined my high beams on him so he knew I saw him and at that point he started running towards a parked SUV that was parked in front of us the entire time. He then got in the car and it immediately turned on and they started driving. At that point adrenaline kicked in for me and I floored it trying to catch up to him while the dispatcher and my boyfriend are telling me to stop driving and park because it's not safe to chase after him right now. About 10 seconds after we park and the SUV is turning right, I see a cop pull up behind us and I immediately roll down my window and gesture to the cop that the guy is driving up ahead of us and he floored it to catch up to him. The cop came back and told me that he missed him and didn't see which direction the guy fled to, but we drove back to my house and were met by five more cop cars, a canine unit and a helicopter hovering over the whole valley trying to search for him. It turns out the guy broke into my parents' window and then focused his attention on their room and stole thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, including my parents' wedding jewelry, as well as my grandparents' and aunt's jewelry. My aunt passed away from cancer over 10 years ago. When he reached mine and my sister's room, is when I pulled up to the house because he rummaged through a bit of our stuff, but absolutely nothing was stolen from our rooms. The cops believed that I bought myself time to get home by leaving the lights on because he took extra time to ensure that nobody was home and that gave me time to pull up to my house and a tear on before he stole more. They still haven't caught the guy, but I guess a house down the street from ours was broken into an hour before ours was and a house maybe 10 minutes away from us was also broken into a couple of hours after us. The cops believed the guy tried to blend into our neighborhood for that extra hour so that he bought himself time for the cops to stop searching so he can move on. There were numerous reports of a suspicious SUV which was parked with its lights off in the other surrounding neighborhoods as it just sat there, which is why the cops believe he was trying to blend in and buy time. So, piece of shit who broke into our home, stole my parents' priceless jewelry, and made us live in fear. I hope they catch your slimy ass, and we never meet again. This is an old story, something that happened to me almost 20 years ago when I was 23 years old. I was writing for a popular budget travel guidebook series, and mainly worked in Central and Eastern Europe. Depending on the time of the year, and which issues were being updated, I could be gone for several weeks, or even several months at a time. 
I mainly traveled alone. I'd ran into a few problems here and there, but my experiences were predominantly positive. I had been working in the former Yugoslavia and was on my way to the Czech Republic from Sarajevo. It's a long journey by train, so I broke it up into several overnight stops. Zagreb at first, and then Budapest, making each leg around 8 hours. It was late January and bitter. There was probably a good 7 inches of snow on the ground, perhaps more in some other places. I was exhausted and battling the remnants of the flu I'd picked up and split. I left Zagreb in the late afternoon and expected to reach Budapest by around 10pm. I bought my ticket in the travel center at the Zagreb train station. When I boarded the car, about half the compartments were empty but there were definitely other people on it. Since the train wasn't crowded, I managed to find a compartment to myself, so I spread out a bit and prepared for a long ride. The first part of the ride was smooth. I worked on some guidebook stuff, wrote in my journal, etc. However, a few hours into the ride, we passed over the Hungarian border and things started to go awry. I heard them before I saw them. There were a group of teenage boys, about five of them that I could see, and they were loud. I could hear them running through the train car, laughing and cursing and banging on the compartment walls. They were loud and obnoxious, but it's not like the first time I'd ever been annoyed by a group of teenagers. I didn't look up, I just kept working on my writing, but as the time went on, they grew louder and louder. As they ran from car to car, they slid the train doors open with so much force that it sounded like a bomb going off every few minutes, and then the sounds got louder. That's when I noticed that they were standing outside my compartment, looking in at me. I could only see three of them through the small window, but there were definitely more. I mean, I had seen them earlier after all. I glanced up at them, frowned, and then looked away. I learned that the best way to deal with that kind of thing was to ignore them. I didn't want to encourage their behavior, but ignoring them seemed to have the opposite effect. Girl, girl, they hollered at me. Come have fun. My compartment door was closed, but they proceeded to mess with me by slowly opening it, pretending they were going to come in, and then shutting it again. It went from chanting, girl, girl to a much more ominous, we're gonna have our way with you tonight, followed by a bunch of slang words for female body parts, some of the more universal ones I had no trouble understanding. At this point I grew very nervous, how was I to know whether they were just messing around with me or they were serious? I couldn't exactly leave to do so, that would mean walking through them, they were blocking my exit and my entrance and then one pulled out a pocket knife. He stuck it out his tongue, ran the blade across it, and then pointed at me and grinned. The guy next to him made his sexual hand gestures toward me and laughed. I tried not to show anything, however, but in my mind I was quickly taking stock of what items I absolutely had to take with me if of course I had to made a break for it. My lack of reaction angered the one with the knife, so he switched from licking it to using it to penetrate the circle he made with his thumb and forefinger. You like? He called out. You die. Part of me figured that they couldn't really do anything. There were other people in the train car after all, and they'd hear me scream. Surely someone would come and help me, right? The conductor hadn't come through since we did the border crossing, so he was due for a trip as well. I figured I only had to get through the next few minutes, and they'd get bored and leave. It was at this point that I noticed the curtain on the door window. I know it sounds crazy, but that's when I lost it. I left the curtain open so that people walking by could see that the compartment was occupied. But now all I could think is that if they came in, all they'd have to do was pull the curtain and nobody walking past would see what they were doing to me. At least one of them had a knife. They were all taller and larger than me. I am a 4 foot 10 and weighed 98 pounds at the time, and they outnumbered me. I now started to tear up. 
Would they kill me? Would I be seriously maimed? I was 23 years old, but a late bloomer. I also had a history of sexual assault. I'd only had consensual sex for the first time a year earlier. I feared rape more than death. I feared pain. My day pack was in my lap, and the only things I had in there for weapons were a fingernail file and a butter knife. Anyway, I reached into my bag and fumbled around until I had one in each hand. But just as they slid their door open and the first guy stepped inside, knife pointed at my crotch. Another voice filled the corridor. I didn't need to speak the language to hear the anger. The guys then ran from my compartment, one dropping the knife, and I watched as a middle-aged man dressed in blue stomped after them. A few seconds later, the train came to a grinding stop. The world outside was creepy. All I could see was snow and blackness. There were no lights in sight. After a few seconds, the train started back again, and the boys didn't return. I was just starting to feel some relief when the man in black returned to my compartment. He was a conductor. English? He asked, and I nodded. I made them leave. They're gone. I thanked him, and he came into my compartment and sat down across from me. It felt good having another adult, a male, in there with me, especially an official one. I felt safer. It's okay, he said again. Gone. Thank you, I replied again. I was so scared. He nodded knowingly and then leaned back into the seat. It happens, he said. Sometimes we get this. They can't hurt. I honestly felt like I was going to pass out from emotional exhaustion. But just as I was starting to let my guard down, the conductor leaned forward again and said, you need the fee. Oh, I said. I produced my ticket and showed him. Here's my ticket to Budapest. He looked at it, shrugged, and handed it back to me. This is a ticket, yes, but there's a fee for Hungary. You didn't pay. This was the second time I'd made that route, and I'd never had to produce anything extra on the train itself. Now I started feeling sick to my stomach. How much? I asked. I had a very little cash. I was planning on taking my money from the ATM in Budapest. He quoted me a number that was around 50 USD. For what it's worth, that's $10 more than what I paid for the actual ticket. I knew he was taking advantage of me, and I wanted to argue. But then he said, If you don't pay, then you have to leave now. We were literally rolling through the blackest night I'd ever seen. The snow looked like it would come to my knees and I didn't want to be dumped in the Hungarian countryside like the boys who were harassing me. I felt like I didn't have a choice. I don't have any Hungarian money, I said. I have been in Croatia and Bosnia. He shrugged. I'll take it. He waited while I rooted around in my backpack and produced $30 in a combination of Czech, Bosnian, Croatian, and Slovenian bills. I left myself $20 USD. I don't have enough, I said. He shrugged again. It's okay, I'll take. With that, he took the wad of cash and then stuffed into his pocket, and then he left. Once he was gone, I gathered my day pack and headed to the bathroom. I had to pass by the other compartments, and as I walked down the corridor, it was at that moment I realized I had been wrong. There were not other riders in the other compartments. They'd all left at some point. I was the only person in my car. If the guys had come in and attacked me, then nobody would have heard me scream. I would have been all on my own. Needless to say, I cried for five solid minutes in the tiny bathroom and then threw up in the metal sink. I never want to meet those guys again or anyone like them and I could do without meeting that conductor again as well. Our car wasn't even turned off before the man started knocking on the driver's side window. My boyfriend and I were visiting our home state after a year away and decided to grab some drinks downtown. We had just pulled into the parking lot of a bar when suddenly he approached us with a white rag which was tied around his wrist. He began gesticulating wildly and attempting to talk to us through the window. 
My boyfriend cracked the window to speak to him. I just got stabbed trying to break up a knife fight, he said, pointing to the rag tied around his arm. Can you give me a ride to get supplies? Obviously, alarm bells immediately started going off in my head. I internally call bullshit on this guy being an innocent bystander to a knife fight, but offer to call him an ambulance anyway. I don't want no ambulance. That'll cause trouble. I just need something to clean it, he replied. More alarm bells, but I do understand that some people fear the police, though I personally feel such a fear is unfounded. So against our better judgment, my boyfriend and I offered to take him inside the bar and buy him a shot to pour on his wound, but he refused, insisting that going into the bar would just cause trouble and that all he needed was a ride to get supplies. In a final attempt to sway us, he offered to show us his stab wound. He lifted the rag, a clean and pristine white rag, mind you, to show us what genuinely looked like a deep cut on his arm. A cut without any blood, anywhere whatsoever, not even on the white rag. The cut was clearly Halloween makeup. We immediately rolled up the windows and then drove away. My boyfriend said that as we were driving off, he saw a second man walk out from behind the bar and stroll down the street with a guy who had been insisting for a ride. I truly believe that had we let him into our car, we would have been either immediately robbed or instructed to drive somewhere, where then we would have been robbed there. We did call the police and reported a suspicious person, but I never found out if anything came of our report. So sketchy dude who faked being stabbed to try and get into my car. Let's never meet again. Stay safe out there, everyone. First of all, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. I'm male, 20 years old, not from the United States. I want to excuse myself if I have any spelling or redaction mistakes because English is not my first language. Anyway, this incident occurred 8 years ago from when I'm posting this story. It was in 2012, and I was 12 years old at the time. My mom bought me a phone to keep communication better, otherwise I wanted a mobile so bad. I had to attend school as normal. Class time was from 12pm until 6pm, so I just organized my bag with every notebook I needed for classes and then I put my phone into my pocket. It was 4 p.m., and all of a sudden, another teacher, Sarah, told our class group that the next teacher wasn't at school. He was sick, so we had no class with him. She asked if we wanted to go home or just play football slash basketball until our parents arrived for us. We all agreed on leaving early. I first left school and then called my mom, who was working at the time. I told her we didn't have class so we could leave early, something normal like that. As soon as I was walking the street, I noticed a weird man who was staring at me a few meters away. It was strange because he had a machete, but I just ignored him. I didn't think he was going to harass me or something like that. All the while, I was just arriving home. I checked if I had the keys. I didn't. My house had a grid and it was kinda difficult to open. I decided to call my mom again, because I can't enter. She told me I had to wait until she arrives, in 30 to 40 minutes, so I decided to wait in front of my house. A few minutes passed by, and then appears the same man who was staring at me earlier. With that being said, he was following me. I was freaked out, and I was so scared. This man had a machete, as well as a gun. He showed me all of that. I really couldn't speak or move to anywhere. He started yelling at me and shaking me off. I remember he told me, give me your things or it's going to be your life. I'm going to kill you. I obviously gave him my phone, my notebooks and my bag. I prefer to lose material things than my own life. Then the man left. It was a complete shocking moment for me. I didn't know what to do. I just stood completely in shock. I then started to cry. Then a neighbor noticed me, and Patricia, the neighbor, asked me what happened. She took me to her house until my mom arrived. I told my neighbor everything, 
so then she called the police. My mom finally arrived. My neighbor had a conversation with her. The police arrived as well. They asked me a lot of things I found confusing. After that, they went with my mom. I don't know what happened after that, though. Now I live in a constant paranoia when it comes to being in the streets. So man who robbed me, scared, and harassed me as well. Let's not meet ever again. It was a pretty standard Friday night. The year was 2003. I was 12 years old at the time. My family just sat down to dinner. My two older brothers were away, so it was just me, my older sister, and my parents. That's when we heard a loud bang come from upstairs. We all looked at each other wondering what it might have been. Must be just a house noise, my mother said. We all nodded and continued eating dinner. About 15 minutes later, we heard another loud bang. This time we knew it wasn't just a house noise. My father suggested that perhaps an animal had fallen into the chimney. So we went around checking the fireplaces, but we found nothing at all. Fast forward an hour later. Dinner is over, and my sister and I were still in the kitchen helping my mom clean up. My mom then asked me to run upstairs and ask my dad a question. I walk up the stairs towards the room and I see their door is closed. I then reach to turn the doorknob and I notice that the door is locked. My initial thought was that my dad went to take a shower and for some reason decided to lock the door. My parents rarely locked their bedroom door so I wasn't entirely convinced but it seemed plausible. I go back downstairs and I tell my mom that the door was locked and my dad is probably taking a shower. All of a sudden from the living room, I hear my dad's voice. What are you talking about? I'm sitting right here. As soon as he said that, my heart sunk into my stomach. I ran over to my father and told him his door was locked. He immediately dialed 911 and we were told to wait outside for the police. The police showed up fairly quickly and then went upstairs to the locked door. They busted the door open and found nothing but a cracked open window. They come back down and told us it was safe to come back inside. They told us that we were the latest victim of the Ninja Burglar. The Ninja Burglar is a man who broke into many homes in the New York area. Every robbery he committed had the same exact MO. He began by stalking his victims. He would watch them for weeks, taking notes on what time they left the house and what time they returned. He preferred to rob people when they were home because chances are that the alarm is not set. What was odd about our situation was that our alarm was set at the time. However, my mom wanted to air out her closet that morning and open the window. Although she did eventually close the window, she forgot to flip the switch that bypassed that window on the alarm system. It was the only window in the entire house that was off the alarm at the time. We are still unsure whether the ninja burglar knew that window was off the alarm or it was just a lucky guess. The ninja used a ladder from a nearby house that was under construction so they could climb up to the second story window. He pried it open with a crowbar and hopped right in. He ended up stealing my mom's wedding ring, some cash from my father's wallet, as well as some other items. While the ninja was doing his work inside the house, the getaway vehicle was stationed a few blocks away. The driver of the getaway vehicle would call the house every 5 to 10 minutes. I clearly remember the phone ringing multiple times throughout the night. If the phone kept ringing, it meant that the ninja was still doing his work. If the phone was quickly picked up and hung up, it meant that the ninja was done and was ready to be picked up. It was a very traumatic experience for me to say the least. For the next few years, I was terrified to stay home alone. In May of 2017, the ninja burglar was sentenced to 22 years in prison. If you want to read more about him and his crimes, just Google Ninja Burglar. 
So my fiance and I have been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three month old kitten that we already have. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, let's look on Craigslist. So I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was two and a half hours away from our home. I inquired about it around 10.30 p.m. I know it was late, but almost immediately I got a response. She sounded very nice over text message and asked to see where I lived so that she would feel settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house. I know I should have just dropped it. At the time, I thought nothing of it though. So I sent them a video and we set up a time for the next day to meet. The next day arrived. I wasn't going to take my fiancé, but he insisted on coming along with me because he wanted to be my protection just in case, since Craig's list is pretty sketchy. So we drove two and a half hours on our way there. As we were on our way there, I was texting this girl that we would get there on time, and she responded, Great, see you then. We arrived to the home, me in the driver's seat, and my fiancé in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl, and I got no response. I called, and no response either. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour, and no response. I went up to the house and knocked on the door, but there was nothing. There was a car in the driveway, but no response from the number or the door. We got there at 6.30, and waited until almost eight. Nothing. The neighbor came out asking what was wrong. I said I'm here since I inquired about a kitten, and she said, A kitten? I said, Yes, it was an ad on Craigslist. She said, No one has kittens in this home. I showed her the ad, and she said, Oh, I know them. They are very sketchy people, and they don't own any cats. I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. So I said, well on their ad it says that they have to get rid of their kittens since their new place doesn't allow pets. So the neighbor said, that's impossible. I have a dog and so does the next door over. I immediately found this creepy and assumed the neighbor was also in on something since it was so creepy and I was feeling anxious as well. I thanked her and left along with my fiance. Literally immediately when we pulled out of the street, I got a text from the girl saying, I'm just now getting your messages. Something must be wrong with my phone. Did you still want the kitten or no? I didn't answer, and we headed back home. What I don't understand is that they didn't get any money from me, but they asked me to show up not knowing I'd be with my fiancé. I had a bad feeling about it. What did they want from me? I guess I'll never know. I, 21 year old female, live with my grandparents in a large city on a busy road. I was just in bed when I suddenly heard the doorbell ring and I was about to answer it, but my grandpa got to the door before me. I am now so glad that he did. I couldn't see the front door from the hallway, but when he opened it, I heard a woman say, Hi, my name is Taylor. I think I know you. I didn't recognize that name, and my grandpa didn't either, because he told her that he definitely didn't know her. He asked how he could help her, and I heard him open the door wider, and then her quick footsteps as she ran away. After she left, I came out to ask my grandpa what happened. He told me about the interaction with a puzzled look and I immediately recognized it as suspicious. We do have a ring doorbell, so we pulled up the video it had taken. It showed a young woman covered in tattoos approaching our yard. As she walks up, she whistles loudly to someone off camera. I watch as my grandpa opens the door, and she says that she thinks she knows him. Now my grandpa is a retired police officer, and tonight he happens to be wearing his t-shirt with the name of our city's police department. When he opens the door wider, she must have noticed his t-shirt, because her eyes widen and she runs away. I watch as the video shows her holding up her arms, crossed in an X, while she runs away, 
and a few seconds later, a man crawls out from behind my car, parked outside, and follows her. Then the woman can be heard whistling again as they walk down the block. My grandpa called the non-emergency police line to report suspicious activity, and two police officers arrived 15 minutes later to hear our statements, as well as to watch the video. They seem to agree that these were most likely two addicts working together, casing out the neighborhood to see which houses they could break into. Since there was no proof of a crime committed, the officers gave us an email to send the video to, and then they left. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if I, a 5 foot 3, 100 pound 21 year old young woman, had been the one to answer the door, instead of my grandpa, a 6 foot 2, ex military retired police officer. So, anyway, sketchy couple lurking around my neighborhood. Let's not meet again. This incident happened when I was like 6 or 7 years old, so I wasn't scared at the time because I didn't really understand what was happening. My dad lived in Thailand for around 5 years with my stepmother, and I went to stay with them there for a week or two, and we decided to stay in a different part of the country that they lived in. I don't remember exactly where we were, but we were staying in this beach bungalow hotel place in a non-tourist area and we were only there for a few hours before this incident happened, but I do not remember seeing a single person at this hotel. The restaurant was empty, the beach bar was empty, the place was just deserted besides the people who worked there. Our bungalow slash room was about a meter off the ground, and was pretty simple. A bathroom, a double bed, and a single. There was a pretty decent TV opposite the beds, with a lot of space in between. Also, what we didn't know until later is that the lock on our sliding glass door was broken. It got dark, and we watched some bug documentary, and then went to sleep. About two hours later, my dad woke me up, and then told me that he had woken up and saw a man who had come into our room, and was just standing in the dark, staring at my dad menacingly as he watched him sleep. My dad was a pretty calm person, and told the man that this wasn't his room, and that he needed to leave, but he didn't do so, so my dad got out of his bed and walked up to this man to kick him out, at which point he walked out the door, and my dad woke me up. We stood on the balcony and looked down the long narrow path to our bungalow, but this man was nowhere to be seen. Later we figured out that he was most likely hiding under our bungalow. About half an hour later, everyone was asleep but me. I was about to drift off, when I saw a hand through the glass door and turned the light on. We got up and looked around, but once again there was no sign of anyone. The same exact thing happened about 15 minutes later. We jammed the door shut with something, I don't remember what exactly it was, and heard the man fiddling with the lock 10 minutes later. We called a reception and they checked the place out, but they couldn't find anything at all. They said to let them know if anything else happens. It was probably an hour later, and everyone was asleep, but I saw this man unjam the door, crawl on the floor to our bathroom like some sort of demon creature, turn the bathroom light on, and then stare at me, smiling. This woke my parents up, and we all ran the hell out of there to the reception, but once again they could find no one at all. They moved us to a special room above the reception, and we left first thing in the morning. Like I said, I was too young to understand what was happening, and to be scared as well. But looking back on it, it still gives me the chills. Updates will be posted at the end of my story. So I've never posted on this subreddit before. Though I have other stories I've buried deep until recently, but this is happening in the present. I've had people stalk and follow me before, and because of that, and my true crime addiction, I've become supremely paranoid and a solid curtain twitcher. 
I, 31-year-old female, reside in an upstairs room that was my first room to myself as a child. I had to leave a bad situation and therefore ended up back at my childhood home. For reference, when our house was built, we were told that the field to our left, with horses and a barn at the time, would one day soon be a development. It was the year 2000 when we were told that, and it wasn't until 2022 that the road started being formed and foundations laid. I already had someone follow me home before when I was young. I posted about it, but I don't know how to link, but I was in a different bedroom next door. My parents put in a free library that's right below my window, and nighttime security lights that are very bright will turn on if you're within a certain distance of the side of my house, the one that my room is on. Now, I'll admit, having an open field next to me so long made me accustomed to not closing the curtains when I change, because there was never anyone to watch. Now there is. For the past two weeks, the burglar lights next to the free library have been going off late at night, because my one side of the curtain is open so I can use my vape. That's the only reason I noticed it all. I didn't think too much at first. We lock all the doors and windows every night, and I'm on the second floor. I also always looked out to see if it was a car, someone walking their dog, or a deer, only to see nothing. To add, they put in a shit ton of street lights around this area so visibility is great, but it just kept happening. So last night I did my usual, and I saw the lights come on out of my peripherals. I acted natural, giving full view out the window I was going to bed. It was about 3am, turning the TV off, closing the windows and curtains, turning the light out. Then I ducked down, peering through the curtains to the sidewalk below. I honestly thought I was going to pass out, when after a few minutes, about five or so, someone comes out from the side of my house, all silhouette, dressed in black. They kept their back to me until the light turned off, but I swear I could still see them standing there looking up like they could see me. I called the police, but while I was on the phone with the operator, I saw him run off. There wasn't much they could do except say they'd have a car drive around and look. My parents are asleep and I know I have to tell them tomorrow. But this scares the crap out of me. If it hadn't been happening for two weeks and was a solo incident, I would most likely be fine about it. But the fact that the light has been going off without me seeing activity and what happened tonight makes me think this person has been watching me and watching my house. So, to the person outside my window, let's please never meet again. Small update. I did tell my parents, and at first they brushed me off, claiming I had a couple drinks and it was late, so I probably just saw someone checking out the library. I then had another conversation about it with just my dad, who said that there had been reports the last couple of weeks of car break-ins and since my car is parked on my side of the street, right outside my window, maybe they were trying to break into it. I pointed out that if he was trying to get into my car, why was he pressed up against the house where he wasn't visible from my window, and why did he at no point go towards my car? I think I freaked him out enough that we are going to potentially get a camera for that area. Given all the development happening around us, I think it's smart even without this incident. Anyway, thank you all for your advice and replies. I'll update here again if anything else happens. One night I was bored sick, so I decided to go venture on Omegle. The experience I had that night, I never thought I'd ever actually see alive, with front row seats in front of my laptop screen. I searched for random users, and most were boring at first. Plenty naked bodies, and close-up vids of guys jacking off. You know, the usual. You see lots of costumes on there as well. Some trying to scare you, others just there for fun. Well, I met this guy. He was dressed in all black, with a Jason-like mask on, a smile painted with red on it as well as blue and red streaks where the eye should have been. 
He was waving a large kitchen knife around slowly, his head cocking side to side. I laughed it off. He couldn't hear me though. He and I had our sound off. So I messaged him still watching, and then I said, Haha, nice one. Didn't scare me though. I saw the bubble pop up that he was typing. I waited patiently as he bent over his free hand as he reached for the keyboard. This was so cheesy, a typical costume, waving a knife around and trying to scare me as he typed. Just then, a text popped up. Oh, you're not scared? I laughed, replying with a, Lamau, of course not. Fake shit isn't scary. Nice costume though, you've impressed me so far. Most look pretty lame. I try to get him to act less and talk more. You should be, he typed, waving a finger at me as if to tisk me. Um, why's that? I start to focus more. He then turns the, I'm assuming, computer towards a girl bound to a large chair. She had bloodshot eyes, screaming. I couldn't hear it, but I could tell. Wow, you two are good actors. I was praying that it was all an act. He shook his head slowly, guiding the knife to her throat. She started to thrash her body around in the chair. I felt myself gasp. Shock filled my veins. Oh my god. Holy shit. Please let this be a prank. I couldn't pry my eyes off easily. I quickly typed in. OMFG. Stop. Stop. Okay, you got me. That's scary. He didn't stop. He slit her throat. Blood then drained out. She coughed up blood and vomit. Needless to say, I couldn't take it anymore. So I clicked off not believing what I saw that night. I just pray that it was all a prank and it wasn't real. I don't remember exactly the time, but I do remember the scene perfectly. Right now I'm pretty short in height, so when I was a child, I probably looked like a gremlin of sorts. Now on to the story. When I was about five or seven years old, I was shopping with my mom in a nearby supermarket. Like any other child, nobody likes to wait for our parents to look for boring stuff and such. So when we passed by the toy aisle, I had a really great idea. I said to my mom, Mom, can I stay here and play with the Barbies? My mom replied by saying, I don't know honey, maybe you should stay with me. Please, I promise to stay here no matter what. Well. Okay, but listen to me carefully. She then kneeled down and looked at me straight in the eyes. You cannot talk with any strangers. I told her, okay. No, I'm serious, my mom said. If a strange adult approaches you saying he's a relative, that he will give you candy or even to go with him if he asked you for it, tell him no and run to me. Do you understand? Yes, mom. Good. I'll be in the bread section. You know where it is. You know the rule. Then she proceeds to kiss me in my forehead and walk away. I immediately started playing with the dolls in the aisle, and I kid you not, literally 15 seconds after my mom left me, an old man appeared behind me. He appeared to be between 60 to 70 years old, and was breathing really weird, like he was panting. Hey darling, the old man said. H Hello? I responded, would you care for a kinder egg? He then takes one out of his pocket. No thank you, I replied. I left the doll and tried to walk off, and that's when he grabbed my wrist. Oh come on, don't you like chocolate? If you want more, you just have to come with me. He proceeds to squeeze my wrist harder. I said no, I yelled out. I don't know how, but I broke loose of his grip and started running towards the bread section. The man then ran behind me for a couple of minutes, until of course he saw me hide behind my mother, and so he fled. I never told my mother what happened that day until I was 16 years old. My family was scared and worried that, because I didn't tell her anything, that the man could have found another victim. To this day, I still shiver to the thought of what could have happened to me if my mother had not told me that advice. So creepy old man in the supermarket. I hope we never meet again, and you are either dead, or you're rotting in jail. 
Hey, thanks for watching today's episode of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast. If you did enjoy, then make sure to leave a like rating and leave a comment down below letting me know what you all thought. Also, if you are a first time listener joining us for the first time and you did enjoy, then consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell beside it. As I mentioned in the intro, we do upload some of the best true crime and scary stories content that you'll hear on YouTube, so subscribe and look forward to more content. Speaking of stories, if you yourself do have a story that you'd like to submit, then do send it in with the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you and a shout out to all my channel members. Thank you to Spunky the Nutcase, Bo, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Robbie, and Susie. Thank you so much. Your support means the world and it helps me with continuation of releasing brand new Scary Stories content and focusing more on the channel. Also, of course, thank you to the regular viewers who watch the videos, leave likes, comments, and share the videos with family and friends. Anyway, that is going to go ahead and do it for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you all on the next episode of the Creepy Fox Podcast. Take care, and have yourself an amazing day.